name is Melissa. I am part of the One Arts and Business Network. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot about what that is, but it is a network of organization of businesses in the Old North End. Um, and we finally have a website up. And let me tell you, the website is amazing. Um, it's really a way for folks to connect in the Old North End um, to look up. It's a directory of all businesses. There's the history. Um, you can see the link right here. Um, our lovely, I forgot your title, economic person, economic coordinator, Emma, put it together. Um, you can be in contact. But really, check out the website. Um, it's here uh, for those at home who are watching on YouTube. It's oneabn.org. That's oneabn.org. Uh, and it really just has a wealth of resources about our wonderful community. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. Who would like the microphone next? Yes. Who else has an announcement, a comment, an issue, or a suggestion? Hi. I'm I spoke to the MPA maybe a little over a year here. ago about the reuse zones at the dump going away. Um, that was, uh, it was countywide. There was Look, areas for people off. to bring stuff that they didn't need anymore and people could pick it up for free. And the job decided they didn't want to do that anymore, so they shut them all down. Um, I went to a whole bunch of meetings no, to try to get them back. I tried to get a job at the dump. And I ended up getting a job at Resource, and through the city and resource partnering, where we just reopened the reuse zone. It's not quite as good as it was. Um, it's it's not a whole room. It's now a shelf within Resource. Um, but I'm I'm working to try maybe make it close to its former glory. Um, so it's not something you can just leave stuff in. You still have to bring things to donate to resource, but I encourage you to do that. Um, any household items, furniture, building supplies, uh, appliances, housewares, anything really, um, computers, um, art supplies, uh, arts and crafts. Um, we have those for sale, but anything that doesn't sell or isn't quite sellable, it goes in every use So we're open 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, Monday through Saturday and Sunday just till 4 um, and we're down at 339 on Pine Street 339 Pine Street um, it's kind of hard to see we move it across the street from where it was before people didn't know that Recycle like North moved across the street and it's tucked in there so come check us out thank you very much yay Good morning. other announcements I know you have one Andrew you want to be the first Hey, I'd just like to say that was awesome, your work. I really appreciate that. Hyde Street rules, right? Um, we brought some voting forms. If anyone would like to register, and if you've moved within the, the, the city, we can, we can change that right here. Um, early voting will start around Valentine's Day. We're about 80 days away from town meeting. And uh, so if anyone would like to get registered or change their address, we'd be glad to help you. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, Andrew. Others, other announcements? Tony has one. Yeah, hi, uh, Tony Reddington. I'm also active as uh, one of the leaders of Pine Street Coalition, and we have, actually have some news. Um, the Champlain Parkway, which as you know, is a $47 million, uh, I don't want to call it a turkey because it's unfair to turkeys, but it's a, a $47 million highway project uh, that uh, totally wastes the money. And that's one reason our group has been working actively along with Innovation Center, uh, which you may be aware of, and that's an outstanding uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, commercial office space building on Lakeside Ave. I've been fighting this now for four or five years. The good news is the project is currently dead. It may come back to life in a few weeks, in a month or two, but right now there is no parkway because the environmental document was withdrawn by the Federal Highway Administration. Why? Because this project actually increases, and here we are up here uh, in the MSB Avenue uh, with uh, the low income neighborhood. Well, the Pine, the King Pine neighborhood is also like we are 80% low and middle, low and poverty income. It's also uh, has one third 
of its households had no access to a car. So they're very dependent upon what? Walking, biking, and transit. So this particular neighborhood had no protection legally until about four or five years ago when they changed the rules. So when the parkway was designed, they just piss off the low-income neighborhood, the, the neighborhoods with minority and low in, and, and low-income people. So the Federal Highway said, oh, we made a mistake, we've got to come back and look at this neighborhood again. So in order to do that, they actually canceled the project for perhaps now for two months and perhaps another three months going into uh, really the spring of next year. This also will allow the Pine Street Coalition, which is in U.S. District Court, to fight for a new design to uh, increasingly have a good chance of winning. So at the, at, the, at the moment, the project cannot go forward. They cannot spend any money on it. And we're hopeful that we might actually work out something with the city, a compromise, in which we get a separate and safe sidewalk. There is no sidewalk in the project. They take the sidewalk that's in front of BED and this Public Works Department away. There is no separate and safe bikeway. There's a walk bike coalition that's been supportive of our efforts and a redesign of the project that is terrible, non-existent walking bike facilities. I'll leave it there, but uh, it, I, I just want to indicate that this is happening. The upper two blocks uh, from, on Pine Street from uh, from Maple Street to King, excuse me, from King to Main Street is in Ward 3. It's the only small section of the project. So it does, it is partially in our, in our area. Thank you, Tony. Hi, uh, my name is Harold Kaplan, and I am uh, having a, a studio sale this weekend, Friday night, 5 to 8, Saturday and Sunday, 10 to 3. Where? St. Paul Street, 309 St. Paul Street, the South End. I live on Rose Street. I work on St. Paul Street. Come down. I'm going to have hot mold cider, meat the balls, crackers and cheese, and it's a pottery sale, so bring in the wallets. I Venmo, I do all kinds of stuff. Anyways, hope you can come down and support me. <laughs> thank you. We're on St. Paul Street. 309, thank you. 309. Other announcements? There's one right here. Hi, Alyssa Favor, Ward 2. Uh, I have a fun fact for all of you. Right now, the governor is taking comments on the governor's budget. It's not really a due date, but I know he does the budget over the holidays. And you can go online and just submit your comment. I have I have a website. I'll put it like in the back if you want to look up the website. Or I guess you can email it too. Um, but I encourage you just Whatever you're most passionate about or want him or the administration to spend money on, go do that. They read every single comment. Even if the government doesn't agree with you, they do read every comment. So it's a pretty good opportunity. Okay. Thank you very much. Who else? See anybody else? Ah, here. Great.
from noon to five on New Year's Eve. Thank you, Ben. If people didn't know, this is Ben Bergstein, and we owe him thanks for maintaining the space and doing all our tech for us. Without him, none of this would be possible, so thank you. Thank you, Ben. Hi, my name is Steve Carey, and I'm uh, running for the second term of the school board. I have my petition here. If you're from Ward 2, I would really appreciate a signature. I want to get on the ballot and continue the good work that we've been doing for the last two years since I've been on, although the board you know, continues to do excellent work for our great Burlington School District. You're going to hear from us in a minute or two anyway, but I just thought I'd mention that. I appreciate your signature on my petition if you are from Ward 2. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, whoa. Get away from me. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have an announcement to? Okay. Turn them off for now. Turn them off. Turn them off. Uh, it's interference from uh, um, upstairs. I got to tell them. Okay, I got to tell the story. Very, very loud. Very, very loud. Can everybody hear me? Are there any more comments? See that I will move to the next item on the agenda. Use the microphone. Use the microphone. Use the microphone. Charlie, Charlie. It's okay? Okay, perfect. Just in time to hear from Three of our school board members, Stephen Carey, who you just met, Liz Curry, and Jean Waltz.
I'm not sure when those are going to be announced, but they're planning on starting them in January. And there is also an email in the meantime to, if you want to give any kind of feedback, any suggestions, and it is superintendent search F B S D B T B S D B T dot org. I just want to say that. Uh, you know, we have 3,500 students in the district. We have 10 schools. We have over 1,500 employees. So it's, a, it's an incredible job. Being superintendent of the district is an incredibly complicated job because there are literally thousands of moving parts on every in every single day. And uh, I just want to thank Yao Bank for doing the work that he's done over the past five years. And uh, we certainly wish him that his best and in, uh, in his future pursuits. Uh, and it is an extremely complicated and difficult job. And in terms of what Jeannie just said, the two commissioners who are responsible for gathering information about what we expect as a commissioner, you know, it's a, I, I made a list. I brought it tonight. I don't need to read it. And I sent it on. But, you know, when I think of it, it there's so much that we need in a leader of the district. and. Um, I'm hoping we can get close to that, uh, if not achieve all of the requirements that we need our new candidate. But anyway, I just want to point that out. It's a complicated and very important job. I think it might be the highest paid job in the, the city. No. In the city? It might be. It might be. But uh, it's, it's uh, you know, well, well worth the salary because of the complexity. But I just wanted to mention that. Um, and if you, again, if you have suggestions or ideas about qualities the board should be considering in its consideration of the candidates who apply, please let us know. Through that website that Jeannie said, you can email any of us directly. We'll pass it on to Commissioner Sauer and Gulick. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Here for your uh, support for the school budget, which you can't see. But uh, what, I, what I put up here is that this is a wish list of all the um, things that we would love to be able to fund. It's $4.4 billion worth of cost. So our task over the next four weeks um, till the second week of January is to kind of call through the list and really determine what's essential, and what's a priority, and what has to kind of be on a multi-year strategic plan. Um, and that is mainly because the state legislature, through our state education and funding formula, has um, sent us the news that the state education tax rate will be 5.5 cents, which is pretty high. Like last year, it was two or three. But the, um, the state education formula is based on total state enrollment, which has gone down quite a bit. And then they take all the school budgets, which are increasing quite a bit because of the, the new health care plan, which is looking at like a 12.9% increase in health care costs. So um, school budgets are going up quite a bit this year, and so, and, but enrollment is down. So the per pupil ratio has gotten really skewed. Um, so the number of people, so if you divide the total, all the school district budgets by the number of pupils, there's, there's like a higher cost spread out over less kids. Um, so that then results in a higher tax rate. Um, so that will affect Arlington's ability to fund all these really important priorities. And so that's what we'll be facing. We'll have um, a meeting next Tuesday and a meeting um, January 14th. And that, sh that would be the meeting we decide, but we'll probably have one more meeting in between that because it's really difficult. So if people have questions, comments on budget items, we'd love to hear from you. And questions, comments? Oh, Stephen's going to make a comment. But I'll just make a comment about the budget. You know, Commissioner Sowers at the meeting on Tuesday night mentioned, you know, it's, it's so difficult. We want to fund everything because these are needs that our employees have put forward to us and they're very serious needs and very very important needs but um commissioner sowers mentioned you know it's important to think about what could be taken away i mean i don't want to use that term actually but what could be withdrawn 
in terms of funding in order to fund some other things or what, what the priorities are. A couple of weeks ago, the principals came to us and they gave a list of priorities which was extremely helpful because they, they again, they got together as a, as a group of principals in the district and they prioritized their needs and they were working together as a district and not as individual schools, so that was very, very helpful. But the bottom line is there's only so much money to go around and we have to make that decision about what can be taken away that's currently funded and how do we shift that money so it's more efficient and effective in delivering the systems that the kids need. Basically, the kids need what we're trying to provide to them and we need to find a way to do it. Thank you. I just wanted to say one more thing actually to summarize this list. What was interesting this year, what we heard from the staff and the principals was that the overriding need in the schools is for um, socio-emotional behavior so, and social worker support so that teachers can just teach. And that came up over and over again, which is a good indication that our state legislature is defunding the social service system and shifting the cost onto the schools. Well, either way, <laughs> like we're gonna pay. But, you know, the schools are now becoming like the social service agency for the state, which is, makes it really hard to teach. It makes it really hard to be a teacher and just get your job done and feel good about it because you're just managing all these social services. So if you have had, if you had a legislature, legislator in the room, which I think we will later, please ask them what they think about that. Thank you. Questions, comments? I wanted to add one thing about the budget too. This is, this everything that is happening in the district right now is happening, is included. This is in addition to. There's, this, there's nothing here right now that might negate or cut or eliminate something else. It's not at this stage. So what you know is what is that, you know, what we intend to fund right now. I have a question real quick. When Yao was here uh, two or three months ago, he said he didn't have, he had insufficient data to uh, correlate the achievement gap between non-white students and white students. And after checking in a very loose way, I found that there is data and it's just not really analyzed. Can you shed some light on why we still have a huge achievement gap? Because according to him, he couldn't do anything about it. It's sort of seemed we are in the midst of actually figuring out what kind of data we should be gathering and you know, it's, and also having a new, there's a new system, there's a new position. Part of the hopefully future, uh, part of the wish list is an additional position to help with this data. It, it, so much of the decision making and how we're going to have an unbiased view about how to fund different programs and eventually close that achievement gap needs to come from this data. And we have not had the kind of data that can be analyzed sufficiently now. There's been different, this has way better information and in history. Well, yeah, no, Jean's right. We, um, this is the first year we've been able to hire a data management person to create stronger data systems. I don't think Yao was saying we don't know how we're going to close the opportunity gap. I think Yao was saying closing the opportunity gap is a complex challenge and um, it requires a you know government institution to change. So you still have the old model of the classroom with the teachers standing up and delivering a curriculum. And we have students coming to school with a wide variety of lived experiences that mean what they bring to school isn't always recognized as valid. And the starting point for teaching them is a, a pretty old model that embodies kind of our, our main dominant culture values. So there's this mismatch, increasing mismatch between, you know, a student body that it has a hard time, you know, really be, you know, changing itself culturally to be the dominant culture, and we, some of us don't really want them to. And then we have teachers who have, were taught to teach a certain way. And, and then you have kind of the complexity of social service needs in the classroom, implicit bias, and um, a kind of swirl of technology 
and um, old teaching, old learning methods. And all of that is like, you know, just kind of brewing. And it makes it very hard to do what's called differentiate for a teacher. And Steve can speak to this because he was a teacher, or he is a teacher, sorry. Um, differentiating means you have to teach at all these different levels in the classroom when you're managing all these different needs. And so, you know, the opportunity for kids to learn is really different when they show up in class. Some can show up and sit down and learn, and some can't do that all day. And so how do you do all that with a pretty anemic amount of money um, compared to the need? In a large class size, and not a lot of personal development. And I'll, I'll say something about the data too, because um, as Liz was saying, it's, it's it's really difficult to measure accurate growth given the variety of kids we have coming from different parts of the world and different experiences at home. So we can, we can look at standardized data sets, but they're not really accurate. And we've talked to the new data manager of our, about um, you know finding some growth that's finding some measure of growth that's that's, um, that's more accurate in terms of individual students. So not just entire classes or entire schools, but how much have these individual students grown as a way to look at the success or failure of the system. So it is a, a data issue, and, and it's, it's hard to get accurate, standardized data from at all, quite frankly. I think the idea is that we don't want it to be standardized, that we want it to be individualized. And that's also moving towards these personal learning plans as well. So, of course it's ideal, um, because SAT, those kind of tests have never been. People living in poverty, people of color have, have never um, excelled. You know, part of why there was all this criticism about H.O. Wheeler back when it was H.O. Wheeler was because we had EL students that weren't doing well on reading exams. Shocker. Right. Um, but if you can show that these kids are improving on their skills, there is growth. The achievement gap is being close. Um, I have a question about what's happening with the renovation remodeling of the high school. It, um, it's getting some bad press, and I'm just wondering what's going on. Yeah, I mean, what's... what's the challenge was that to get voters to vote for the bond, they'd have to, you know, kind of go out there with like, oh, we're going to have this great new high school, and, you know, it's going to have, and we want to hear what everybody wants. And so everybody had the opportunity to say what they wanted. But at that point, you know, we didn't have the money to, like, pay an architect to actually calculate how much all that would cost. So once the bond passed, we came out with the amount it would have cost to build what everybody wanted was about 120 million. We had a 70 million dollar bond. So um, I think that's why it got that cut because it's hard to explain to the whole city that you know just because you want it doesn't mean we can actually do it. But we need support to do something different because our existing building is so atrociously inaccessible and unsafe and energy hogging and all that. So we did, through the brilliance of our um, project manager, um, advertisement for Tom Peterson, um, he was able to get the gap down to 20 million, so kind of value engineering. And it's still a beautiful building. We've given up some external things, some outside things. Um, we have configured some internal things, but have preserved some of the essential things that, you know, really there was huge consensus that we need. Um, and so now we have a 20 million gap. So t the 20 million is in such a big pro project, a less significant gap is still a problem. But um, I think it might actually be down to 10 million. I think they got it down to a 10 million dollar gap actually in the last minute. So we're getting there. It's still going to be an amazing building that you know will be much more functional, energy efficient, and really fully accessible, which is personally my main goal. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, seeing nobody. Thank you. For, it's very nice to have three school board members here. The job is very, very important.
program. It is the mayor's update. Unfortunately, the mayor can't be with us tonight, so we have 20 family minutes. Um, city councilors are all here. Perry, Brian, Max. The floor is yours. Thanks, Barbara. We will um, just try and touch on some issues that we think might be of interest that we're working on, but also leave time for discussion and questions and make it a little bit more of a, of a dialogue. Um, the issue I'll start with is that the uh, ballot in March will include a um, question asking the voters of Burlington to um, authorize that the um, tax rate, which is currently on, on a affordable housing, which is in Burlington, the term is used, the housing trust fund, is was approved by the voters 30 years ago, March of, of 89, uh, to be a penny to support affordable housing through the trust fund. I won't get into great detail about why it changed over time, but basically as the grand list value grows, the penny on the tax rate um, was, by, by charter, was required to keep revenue neutrality for several uh, dedicated funds, and the Housing Trust Fund being one of them. So even though over the 30 years uh, the grand list has grown, the revenue to the Housing Trust Fund has actually decreased in relation to the tax rate. So we're actually at about a half a penny right now. So this is just a sort of a wave of back to the voters to say, can we commit to the penny and lock it in and actually have it grow with inflation with the grand list over time? So that's, that's one question that will be before the voters. I think it's really important. I think the support at the local level uh, is critical because federal support has not entirely dried up, but it is a fraction of what it was even when this was created in Burlington. So we need to do something locally to support affordable housing for very low income, low income, and some moderate income folks. So this is a critical piece. Uh, there will be another question that deals with public safety. I'll try to do it with the baby behind my back. Um, Public, public safety is, we don't know, Ben doesn't know. Um, it's really an issue that will deal with the number of people we have on our, on our fire department crew that also responds to medical emergencies. So a new ambulance will be required in the new North End, which has never had an ambulance, and it will actually require more staff to staff that. So that'll be a question on the ballot as a public safety question. And the last thing that I'll touch on is the issue of, of um, overnight storage of the Amtrak and the question of will there be a second rail line on the, what I would consider the urban or the downtown waterfront between College and King Street. And um, a new option has emerged. There was some news on what the options were. All of them had problems and concerns with adjacent properties and impact on um, members of the community. Um, this latest option is actually a siding that would be installed or created at McNeil plant where the train currently stops uh, with uh, wood chips and there would be essentially a little spur that would come off and it would be the place where the uh, Amtrak would overnight. That's the latest option. So um, the issue of whether a second track gets added on the waterfront is, um, I love trains. If I could take a train and not have to drive a car to go to New York, I would be thrilled and I think a lot of people would. And it would do a lot of great things for regional economy, and I think we can all agree on that. However, adding another track on the waterfront, let's just picture what it would do. It would take what is currently the, the bike path between College and King, and it would be a, primarily a railroad track that would be available to Vermont Rail System to store their trains, to build trains, to be essentially an extension of what is really the rail yard, which is south of there. So it would bring a rail yard use to what has become you know, an amazing place for residents and bakers alike. And uh, I'm committed to that to not happen. I don't think we should be reindustrializing that part of our waterfront, even though I'm a huge fan of trains. I think we have to find an appropriate place for them. So. Um, I wanted to. I wanted to um, speak about the um, work of the um, Special Committee to Review Policing Practices, which continues to go on, um, also about the Range Choice Voting Initiative that just came up, and then a little bit about the airport, um, which I think I'll get a little bit of assist from 
Councillor Tracy and Pine, regarding some of the technical aspects, but just want to sort of speak about what's going on with the airport right now. So, regarding the special committee, it was supposed to have um, recommendations by about this time, and so the committee sent um, a communication to the council to ask for an extension, um, and within that, the council tasked the committee with coming back with, originally it was use of force recommendations, and I'm trying to, within the next, no, I can't. No, I can't remember. But within the next few months, um, specifically, and then I also pushed for that to expand to also community oversight because I felt like the scope of the committee has been so broad that it's been really sort of hard to dig into any specific um, issues or policy areas. Um, but those two sort of aspects, the aspect of oversight and then also of um, there was, I think, a lot of interest from the council, particularly to look at use of force, um, are really important. Uh, so I'm, I'm really, I think also my role, I, I would like to see more focus just in terms of what I'm pushing for and I think the oversight aspect is something that I, I feel really strongly about and we'll, um, we'll start to really push for um, that committee to review and create some pretty strong recommendations. Um, so there was that aspect. The rank choice voting, um, this came up as an initiative that all the progressive, most, all progressive counselors, except the, I don't know if counselors are he might not have co-sponsored. Did he co-sponsor? Okay, all five of us co-sponsored. There's a lot. Um, and but it was uh, something that Councilor Hanson had brought forward um, as something he really wanted to push. Um, co-sponsored by all of us. Um, we were really looking to get it on the ballot by March um, in order to have it. I, in my my opinion was I wanted it to be um, able to be implemented by the mayoral election in 2021. So that got sent to charter change. Um, I mean, I know you're gonna speak about charter change. I was at charter change as well. They, the motion, it was the last agenda item, and the motion was to adjourn and table it. Um, and so it, and I don't know if any of you saw the seven days article, but it just effectively um, pushed it past the December 16th council meeting when we would be reviewing it and putting it on the March ballot. So that pushes it to the November ballot, which means it can be implemented by the mayor election in 2021. Um, so it wouldn't come into effect by the mayor election um, in 2024. I'm a big proponent of our CV of ranked choice voting. I think it's um, a more democratic and a fairer way to vote. I was really excited to see it potentially be implemented in a mayor election because I think many of us were frustrated by feeling like um, we couldn't have more than two candidates um, in the last mayor election. Um, and I just, I really hate forcing voters, uh, making voters feel like they have to have strategic voting or that there's gonna be a spoiler candidate, um, that people should run for elections and that we should have a democratic process um, and we shouldn't feel like we, um, that it's not, um, yeah, that it's not open and fair. So I was I was disappointed to see that um, that it's being delayed further, but you know we'll continue to push it. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about was the airport. Um, there was a presentation on the um, mitigation efforts in order to deal with the uh, sound impacts of um, the airport in general, but I think really specifically the F thirty five. And I have a lot of concerns. Um, I felt like oh. Uh, Many counselors, myself included. Well, I just feel like it's a, it's a lot too late in terms of really looking at the, how we're going to make sure that people aren't so negatively impacted by um, the F 35s and other, you know, the airport in general. But really, it's I think it's clear that it's really the most from the F 35. And what I was really concerned about was um, there's no, we don't know where the local match is going to come from. There's like 10 percent potential for a local match and. I really pushed the um, uh, director, Junior Richards, to give some indication about where that, and I think he more or less assured that we would find it or wanted to give sort of some sense that it wouldn't delay the process. Yeah, that we would try, essentially, but yeah. they don't have a local match identified at this point. Which is frustrating, and it concerns me because I think when you have these programs that have a lot of Funding is coming from the federal, the state, municipal. It, it can, it can delay it. I think and that's what they, I mean. I think they felt like they wanted to assure that it wasn't gonna, um, that there wasn't gonna be any issue with implementing it. But then, the part that I was hoping for assistance on was about the. Um, I don't really, I don't understand the modeling, or I was, 
I just had well, to... well, so one of the things that they do in order to understand what the, the sound impacts are is that they, they do an environmental impact study and they model out how the sound is actually going to behave. And so now that they're actually here, they want to make sure that they want to make sure that it's actually conforming with that. So another aspect of, of this is also ins installing sound monitor devices. And again, there's a cost, a significant cost to installing those devices on um, just the process of figuring out where to place them so they give back the appropriate uh, the appropriate data. So um, that's one of the things that there's, again, that's still in process with, with this. Yeah, and there's an ongoing monitoring cost, exactly. Thank you. I needed a refresher. Um, so that's a, that was an aspect, and then um, just in general, I spoke about with my frustration that we're getting $10 million to expand the airport. Um, this might not be the most popular opinion, but um, I don't think that we, I've said this many times at council meeting and publicly that I don't believe that we should be expanding air travel, that I was disappointed to see that um, greenhouse gas emissions from the airport were not included in um, the roadmap to decrease our emissions, that I'm concerned. Um, in real time about um, the impact we're having on our environment. And um, I will you know, continue to push for that. And I think there's just like, the money that's going into the F-35 um, noise mitigation and then the money going to expand the airport. I said, you know, I'm just really concerned in terms of the humanitarian impacts and the, um, the financial impacts and, and the fact that we're in this crisis um, climate emergency. And um, how are we spending millions of dollars in what I feel is completely the wrong direction. Um, so that was something that I just, wanted to highlight, um, there is, yeah, maybe it's not the most common, but um, there is a, the Flight Free 2020, I've signed on to that, I've, um, I feel strong with that, so thank you. Okay, so a um, couple things I just wanted to touch on. Some of the things that have already been mentioned. Um, so um, with the Amtrak issue, um, we are going to be having a Transportation Energy Utilities Committee meeting. I chair that committee, and we've been dealing with this, this uh, Amtrak issue. Um, and that will be at 5 at DPW on Tuesday. Um, so if you're interested in learning more and getting a fuller picture about um, what's happening with um, with that particular issue, um, please feel free to join us. It's down at the, the DPW facility on, on Pine Street. and. Uh, just a couple things to add with that. We had invited the rail, uh, Vermont Rail, to come to that meeting um, to really answer folks' questions and to, to just give us more information because there's concerns on if they do install a second track, um, what Councilor Pine was referring to in terms of the, the reindustrialization that I think is important to understand is that once that second track goes in, they can use that second track because um, for what, what, whatever they want, at whatever time they want because of the way that federal rail law works. Um, they have preemption essentially, so they can build cars, move cars through that space. They can really do what they want with it. In fact, and so that's a real, uh, a real concern. And I certainly share Councillor Pine's concerns uh, on that particular issue. Um, the McNeil site um, is interesting in the sense that it's uh, potentially uh, more further away and might have less impacts on it. We just got uh, today um, the. They had done a study on, on the five existing sites, north, far northern um, urban reserve, so sort of by uh, the beginnings of North Beach, uh, then southern urban reserve, Ma Main Street Landing, so the, the area between King and, and, and College, uh, storing it in the rail yard, or storing it uh, further down uh, in the south end. And they did a scoring measuring that basically looked at how, how the impacts of each of those different sites were made. What we asked them to do was actually to, to run this new idea, this new site, uh, through the same metrics so that we can understand the environmental impact. So we'll be hearing more about that uh, and this new site. Um, there's some potential, you know, we need to understand the impacts on to that part of the work then. It actually, uh, I heard today, will be more closer to Queen City Steel, actually, is what they're thinking about. So if, like, if you're coming down the road in the intervale, sort of like, you know, across the tracks, sort of right there is where it would be. Um, potentially. So that's something for us to weigh and certainly we'll get to talks on that. Um, that's that piece. Um, on the ranked choice voting, um, we are also, um, that because of the way that it played out um, in committee, it was very frustrating. We have um, basically, I wanted to at least open the conversation and continue it, but, and I chair that committee as well, and, and uh, made it, uh, an attempt to, um, to open that discussion, but both of the other counselors. Um, so that they had previous commitments, so they moved to adjourn and adjourn the meeting before we even opened that item. So um, what that means is that we were not able to vote it out to the full council for Monday's meeting, which is the deadline for getting charter changes on, because you have to, whenever you put a charter change on the ballot, have public hearings. What, yes, so 
So what happens is, so what will happen now is it, it's still on the charter change agenda. So I emailed them to say, can we get another meeting on for this week? Can we try to, to open this discussion? They said they're busy, so they, they won't, won't meet, so we couldn't meet this week. So then I said, well, can we do something else in January, in, in this month? They said no. Um, and then so what we're looking at probably for for taking up that ranked choice issue would be in January. But I'm committed to, to continuing to discuss it at committee and give folks a chance to weigh in. I see a bunch of people here tonight who came, and thank you for coming. We really appreciate you participating, um, encourage you to, to, to continue to do so, um, so we can move forward on that issue. While we're on charter, just wanted to touch on a couple other things that you're going to see potentially on the March ballot, the councils that we moved forward to the council. One is an idea to basically combine the city and state ballots. If you ever asked for a ballot, an absentee ballot early, you'll, you, you may, have, may have gotten your state ballot sent separately from your city ballot because they're on separate ballot forms. The state ballot has to be available 45 days before the election. The city ballot only has to be available 28 days currently. So what the charter change that we move forward would say is that it would align basically the city ballot with the, the state ballot. So if they'd be available 40, both be available 45 days before the election. You would get them at the same time, be able to send them back at the same time. So that it, because what we were finding is that people would get the state ballot, vote, send it back, say, oh, I did my job, and then they get this other ballot and they'd be confused and they wouldn't send it back. And so we were seeing big differences in that. So this will, the, the one drawback is that it means that if people are getting petition signatures, you know, or people are trying to put stuff on the ballot, it moves it up, we have to have our process up. But if it passes, we'll know that for a year in advance leading up to it. So I don't really see that as a, as a big drawback of it. The other issue um, is regarding the, uh, the airport commission uh, and adding a member from Winooski. Given what we just talked about with the airport, I think it's helped. We already have a South Burlington member on the airport. They're feeling the brunt of the F-35s in their community. And so what we said, uh, what we forwarded to the full uh, council was a proposal to add a, a resident of Winooski to that commission. And then also to keep the, because that would make it six, we added another Burlington representative. So it's, it would be seven representatives, seven people on the commission, but getting Winooski a seat at the table so that they can actually um, vote and understand these, these conversations and just really um, just bring their concerns to the table. So those were, um, and then the other, the last thing, thank you, you just reminded me, the last thing that we, we also advanced to the, to the ballot was um, non-citizen voting in, um, in municipal elections. So um, this is a, question to allow folks um, who have permanent resident status in the United States um, the ability to participate in local elections. And so um, that's a charter change that um, if the council votes yes on Monday, we'll go through that public hearing process uh, and we'll be placed on the ballot for March. So you could potentially see that on the ballot as well. Can I speak to that? Yeah. Okay, too. So, and something I was glad to see um, was that the city attorney's office had reached out to Micro Justice and ACLU to I believe. Um, but Micro Justice um, said that they support it because there was some concern that it would create a separate list. Of that. And basically, what Micro Justice said is that the government already has this list. These are permanent residents that are already highly documented. Um, so there's not like a separate list. And even, you know, ICE or whoever else wouldn't. It's not anything we don't already know. And that, that really helped me, I think, um, knowing that information. And basically, I think what Micro Justice said was that it could even go farther. It could be even more expansive. Um, so that, that, that made me feel a lot better. And I wanted to share that because um, I thought that was really good and um, important feedback. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I just want to say I do support that. I, I support all those charter changes. I think that those would be helpful in terms of increasing civic participation and giving giving additional. No, no, she about to move this. Okay, I see several comments and questions, and I have nobody taking the mic around. Um, who has the other mic? I have a mic. Oh, okay. Can you share one? We have the mic. Okay. What is huge disability or about the situation. Is there a way that we can persuade them to meet with you? I mean, there are times it's like, well, call your, you know, call your counselor, call your, is there a way? I know it's absolutely, no, I'm saying, I don't know how charter works. I don't know if there's a public influence that, that we can say, this meeting needs to happen. So, um, we would have to basically meet like tomorrow or over the weekend, I don't think that that would happen really, um, and just in terms of the, the timelines, you kind of, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, we, we, yeah, you can't do that, so um, we, yeah, so 
so that's the real challenge of it. And I really want to give, there was, there was a number of different ideas that were expressed, um, different styles of doing ranked choice voting, um, and I think that it, it would be helpful to, to have some community process around it. I thought we could at least, we that we could have that conversation at that meeting and then vote it out, but because um, we've already done this, it worked well. Um, you know, people conflate sometimes the, the outcome with the system. The system worked perfectly, they may not have liked the outcome, but um, the system worked just as it was supposed to, and there was a very, very small uh, amount of spoiled ballots, which indicates that people understood how the system worked. So I think since we don't have a committee that will meet and discuss and put it on the ballot before the voters, I think we need people, though, to express their support, even though you have supporters here, um, at council meetings, wherever you can, express support and build the political consensus that I think is out there. We just need to build it. And, and I was wondering if we should put it as like an advisory question or try to amend the agenda, which takes a two-thirds vote, but it sounds like there's been also some interest in not wanting to to make sure that there is a process through the Charter Change Committee, so I I I'm interested in y'all's input then. I have Francesca and then Liz. I was just hoping for some clarification on the non-citizen voting because from my understanding from the meeting this was affecting people who had like work visas um, rather than just like broadly undocumented people and non-citizen to me is very confusing and unspecific um, though I was more like undocumented folks having voting rights so I was just wondering if you could clarify like who is being affected by I think the thing that the green card is the key. If you have a green card, under this scenario, you'd be eligible to vote. If you don't have documentation, you're not going to be eligible to vote. I just wonder, I would make a suggestion about if you're putting that on the ballot um, to be more specific with the wording, because I think non citizen sounds very confusing. Um, and I wonder about saying, like, like permanent residents with green cards or like blah blah blah, like making it more specific. <laughs> we this went over this in committee and I can't remember what we arrived at as the final question and wording. Um, we, I can get back to you, Francesca, I'm sorry that I don't have it off the top of my head, but that's a great question because we definitely wrangled with that because we did want it to be clear to folks who is and isn't included in this in the question. And we adopt um, short, we, we adopt, uh, a short form question that goes in the ballot that's supposed to be easily understood. So um, that's something that we can make sure we, we take into account. And like I said, I can get into what we actually settled on um, for the full council. Is it, the term is like legal resident? Is it yeah, it's something along ballots? those lines. It was like a, a legal permanent resident. Did you want to speak to your points? Just and just that we, again, on uh, the political sort of angle, which is that. Um, we need to talk to friends, neighbors, and everybody to, to just you know cross this threshold from people thinking that we're um, extending voting rights to um, you know people who aren't documented. I think that's that's one of the challenges from five years ago. There were people who thought we were essentially extending voting to people who were not documented. Um, I personally have a problem with that, but that's not what this is. Um, I'm wondering if you all have. Anyone from the city has talked with the school district about aligning the ballot with the state because it will place an extreme burden on the school district to get its budget done. We don't get the state tax rate until we just got it last week. And that's the preliminary tax rate um, because then we have to, um, they wait for like a lot of data to come in at the end of the year. Our audit doesn't isn't done until like the first week in January, so we don't have real audited figures that we're working with. And so between the state um, homestead and income tax rate and our audit, we can't actually calculate our real budget figures and our Burlington tax rate and the CLA until like the second week of January. So I am really worried about moving the ballot data, I just, unless we can have a separate school district ballot. That's a great question or a great point. I didn't that didn't come up, and this because this came out of uh, this came from the administration saying you know this is something that we we've noticed you know in terms of the, the voter differential we want to address that, but that's a great point. 
I think that's something yeah. important to follow up on. Yeah, no, you. that's something that's important to follow up on. And, and thank you, Liz, for raising that. I really appreciate that. Other questions, comments, Tony, and then Joe? Uh, first, uh, Brian and uh, Tony, uh, thank you for being here tonight. And you got it for a what this shows, what this experience of suddenly trying to figure out what we're going to work with a train that came up the spring, no participation, no involvement of in the community or the council for that matter, and we're going to put it down uh, right in the, basically in the front of the, right, right where the flight path goes through. What's important here is that the city really needs to do a long-term waterfront plan that will take into consideration when we get more trains, as we will with perhaps the commuter rail, we may get a uh, light rail plan before being brought down. We have a light rail plan that was done in the 1990s. And it's nice thing about light rail, 100% renewable. There's no, uh, uh, no, no uh, global warming, global heating with it. Uh, so the point I'm going to kind of, kind of get at is that if the transportation needs uh, which will occur, including the need to be able to get down to the waterfront, are dealt with, we really need a comprehensive planning process led by the planning commission um, and so that we're ready next time to absorb what changes occur in transportation instead of running around in circles as we have for the last three months trying to figure out where to put a train that we knew was coming here 30 years, uh, excuse me, the effort to bring Amtrak to Burlington from Rutland began 20 years ago. We didn't have to run around and figure this out this summer. We knew this was coming uh, a long time ago. Uh, I like the, the right to voting. We should be doing that. Maine had eight years of a governor who never got a majority vote. Uh, wasn't a very good governor. Uh, we don't need to repeat or uh, to, you know, end up with a situation like that. Um, other than that, I'm really pleased that you folks have, have, have found that we are in a climate emergency. Uh, I too am concerned about uh, ever flying uh, in planes again because of the uh, both, both the uh, basically emissions, uh, and I think that uh, in terms of emergency, we need to put pressure on our legislature and our legislators to deal with where half the uh, emissions um, occur in global heating in Vermont are from transportation. It's not from not from home heating. It's not from the building, It's not from the, it's from the cars and. Uh, from uh, basically the automobile. So I uh, hope to keep, keep at it and that we get uh, really uh, some effective changes both in culture within city government and also in the larger community. And I think the university should be coming into this process. Um, Champlain College went from 800 cars to their students. They said no more cars. There are only 200 cars that uh, are, are in the city of Burlington at Champlain College. We have no such limits in the case of the uh, university. We should start to begin to look at places like that for change. Uh, just a quick one uh, for Brian about the uh, ranked choice voting. Uh, there was talk at the city council meeting about you know, the, the history of ranked choice voting in Burlington. And I forget who said something about it, but like it didn't get too deep into like why it was why it didn't go over so well. And Max, you mentioned uh, someone about that briefly as well. I'm curious what, you know, being involved in the system for so long, I'm curious what your take is on, on that. I think it would be hard not to connect Bob Kiss with the defeat of ranked choice voting. Um, as much as Bob is a friend of mine for a long time, he's a wonderful human being, Bob made a couple of key mistakes and the voters conflated the two. They conflated Bob's mistakes with the way that we elect people in democracy. Those are not the same thing. And there was a narrative that was created by people who didn't like IRV because IRV essentially recognizes that the political system of just two parties is limiting in your options and is not as inclusive, it's not pluralistic, it's fundamentally less democratic. And so the notion of having three, four, or more um, threatens some people. And so they didn't like it, and so they used the mistakes that Bob made and the confidence that the public lost in the administration as a way to defeat IRV. That's Thank you. And we did have it from 2005 to 2010, and I, we are the only place to have repealed it, which is fascinating to me. <laughs>
And one of the things that was instrumental in the repeal was that the, the campaign was keep voting simple, is what they said in the repeal. So they said keep voting simple, keep voting simple. But, and that's what people say, but I think we should give voters some credit, first of all. I think that people are pretty able to, in the context of an election, say what their first, second, and third choices in an election would be. Or what their first and second choices are, and they don't even have to vote for a third if they don't like the third person. So. And humans do it every day, constantly for doing ranked choice voting at home. That was really confusing for people, though, to keep voting simple. For people who didn't really understand what the vote was, they were like, they voted for it to repeal it because they were like, yeah, of course I want it simple. Because I heard that from people who were like, wait, what did I just vote for? And like, what? There's a comment over here. Hey there. Um, my question is, so we, we have uh, the net zero plan, the Burlington net zero plan, and we recently also did the energy crisis uh, language. And I want to ask you three um, what you feel are your, your role and next steps on those two fronts. A great question. I don't. Um, I've looked at the, um, the well, for the last five years. I've served for Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, looking at how to use financing as a way to unleash the desire of people to actually do good things for the planet and to use a creative way to finance improvements in buildings. If we're focused on buildings in this case. As Tony mentioned, our uh, larger driver is certainly the transportation sector. Um, but at the local level, uh, we need to come up with a way, basically it's called on-bill financing. And if you do it through the electric company, tariffed on-bill, and it gets rather into the weeds, but it's basically a way to finance the improvements that you need to get your home to uh, as close to net zero as possible, unless you, I mean, once you install renewables, of course, that, that equation starts to get um, more feasible. But essentially making energy investments in buildings and using the bill as the way to repay it so that your savings is greater than your monthly payment. So if you're saving $200 a month, this is simple math, but your payment to that financing is only 150 you actually end up with something in your pocket and you've made the improvements to your building. Utilities can do that, BED can do that. It's a huge lift to come up with the capital that we would need, but it would be a game changer if we offered that to residential and commercial customers. And that's the thing. Yeah, and it, and it benefits rental units as well. So renters benefit, not just homeowners. I just want to say that Maine did adopt a rank away from trade voting last year. It was used to help federal and state compliant elections. And apparently, the reason was because they got eight years of the government who never got the dirty vote. The question was about the emergency. I think uh, I've been thinking about this a lot. I and I see um, Representative Cheney here, so I don't want to. I'm sure we might touch on this, but I did go to the um, Climate Caucus Roadshow. That the um, this is the state, you know, wide level Climate Caucus um, last Tuesday, and I feel like I've been doing some soul searching since then. I feel concerned about and underwhelmed by that presentation. I've also, you know, when I started thinking about this role and thinking about policy right here on the municipal level, I started looking a lot into, um, you know, I was excited by the um, enthusiasm around the Green New Deal nationwide and so on the national level and I was really curious to see what municipalities are doing as a response to that. And when I was looking that up, there wasn't really anything. Like it was so new. Um, and I think I'm really excited now, like Kansas City is the first city now um, in the U.S. and Missouri to um, have created a fair free transit system. And I think that's incredible and amazing and I'm so excited. Um, and I think I'm feeling a really dead push for those kinds of changes and I think we're already seeing that a little bit. There's um, some push around weatherization. Um, there's a campaign going on in Burlington right now to um, do some work around that. Um, I think I'm interested in how to bring a more clear framework to that. Um, and think about the, I'm, I'm frustrated. I feel like there's not a lot of clarity around the, the political economy that we're living in and um, the kind of mode of production that we have and um, where, where is capitalism really leaving us at the end of the day. Um, it's exhausting people and it's exhausting our, our resources. Um, and I feel really frustrated um, and I feel interested in 
and be more um, more thoughtful about that and thinking about what that means on a local level um, because I think cities can be and should, um, especially with what we're seeing at a national level um, in terms of the Trump administration. So I appreciate that question. Um, so stay tuned. Yeah, so a couple things. In addition to the, the fair free transit, I think we've what we've seen is we've actually lost ground in terms of ridership. Ridership is down four percent since the implementation of next gen, the new uh, bus routes and systems. So we really need to address that and, and figure out ways. I think part of it was the, the way that that was rolled out. I think part of it was also delays and things in terms of the headways that existed uh, on certain routes. Um, but I think that also this this fare free concept is something that we need to, to continue to explore, and, and that's another thing that will. Uh, that, that I think we're going to continue to explore at the Transportation Committee. Um, there's a, we have a traffic fund and there's, there, we want to explore whether we can use some of the, the funds that we get from parking meters or from maybe not having builders build parking spaces but then contribute to a fund that would fund things like that. So there are ways to fund that. I think we also really need to continue to build out our, our bike, net, bike and pedestrian network in the city of Burlington get people out of cars. We continue to lose ground on vehicle miles traveled. We continue to see the, the amount of vehicle miles traveled go up year over year in the city of Burlington. So we absolutely need to continue to, to make, uh, to improve our sidewalks, to improve our bike network, to create connectivity and, and safety to get people who would ride if they felt safer actually doing so. And then we actually need to maintain it because if you maintain it, uh, especially throughout the winter, you can actually continue to see people ride. And Montreal found that and that when they maintained their system, they saw over a three year period uh, when, from the time that they started implementing their winter maintenance and really improving it, 150% growth in winter ridership. So you can really see that growth if people feel safe. So I think that's a crucial thing that we, we need to do. The other area on the energy sector that we were talking about and an area that I continue to be interested in exploring and pushing is the, the idea of capturing the waste heat at the McNeil plant uh, in the Old North, uh, in the Inner Vale. Um, and then using that to heat and cool buildings. In order to make that economically viable, however, we need to make sure that we have uh, large tenants on hand. We've tried to get the, the hospital to play ball, we've tried to get UVM to play ball, they've been resistant, which has been incredibly disappointing. And then the mall came along and they said as part of the, the sweetening of the deal that they were gonna, that they were gonna be a, an anchor tenant, essentially, helping us to create the demand, the, 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 the opportunity to do so. Now we're really, we're, we're concerned, I, you know, with the, the project changing and, and this, you know, I think we, we need to really hold them to what they said they were going to do, which is really sign on to this district energy concept, because that was something that I felt was very clearly sold to the, the voters is, you know, this is something that we want to do in order to sweeten that deal, and now I'm feeling like a little bit like they're, they're being a little wishy-washy on that. So I think it, there's an accountability piece to it as well, but I think we need to continue to push it. The challenge with it is that there has been a glut of natural gas on the market, and that's caused the business case uh, with regards to that to be challenging, um, but I think that the environmental case uh, at this point overrides that, um, that we need to continue to push forward with that because that's the single largest thing that we've identified as being a, 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 a way that we can cut greenhouse gas emissions in the city of Burlington. We've seen great growth on the electricity side in terms of renewables and those kinds of things, but we need to do much more on the heating and cooling side in order to address that and be able to be a big part of that. I'm coming at this from the other side, Max and others. Um, we lost several hundred parking spaces when, when the mall was taken down. Um, what they're proposing to put back isn't nearly as many. I hear, and I, I know you're considering this thing where developers will not be required to um, build parking for their developments. I, you know, I don't want you to be in a bubble. You're young, you can walk, you can bike, um, but the public transportation infrastructure for doing these things is not there. I have friends in Williston and South Burlington and Shelburne and Charlotte. They will not come into town. Even though the administration says there are dozens and hundreds of parking spaces, the perception is to be near where they want to be, near the Flynn, near Church Street, near wherever, there are parking spaces. They don't, they don't want to come and eat, they don't want to come and watch a movie, they just don't want to come because they feel that the city has, is, is just not convenient to use. And the bump outs now make it harder to drive. I understand, I really do understand the goal of having fewer cars in the city, but you can't do that until you have the public transportation infrastructure that runs all night, that's freer and expensive, that goes everywhere, 
This is not New York. You don't have that. You have 30 below sometimes in the winter time. Where you can't bike, you can't walk. <coughs> Especially, just think about when you're 30 years older and how that's going to be. So, I, you know, I hope you really consider that, that bill when it comes up. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what Barbara's talking about is the idea of removing parking minimums for buildings. And what that means is basically, or parking, what that means is basically that developers are required to build the minimum amount of parking as part of developments now. This would not require them to, to continue to do so. And if they didn't, then they, then there's language actually that I'm hearing from Councilor Hansen that they're actually putting in to actually have them pay in to a transportation demand management fund so that they would be able to generate some of those alternatives that you're talking about. But you're, you, know, you are right that some people do need to use their cars, older folks, disabled folks. And this isn't about, this isn't about that. This is about you know, getting people who, we need to get people who can walk and bike out of their cars. We really, we, we're facing a crisis of epic proportions in our society and we have to change. We have to figure out alternatives and it's uncomfortable, it's challenging, but we can't just continue to do the same thing and expect uh, different results uh, with this. So I'm, 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 I understand that it's challenging, but I think that we really need to, to continue to, to, to try different things and see if they can work. I think that as part of that too, and I see this all the time, is that car-centric thinking permeates so much of our society. We're so used to cars being uh, just a, a function of everything in, in daily life that it cuts off a sense of imagination about what the possibilities of the public right away might be and trying out other things. And I think that we also need to be open to, to trying other things and seeing if they might work because sometimes in other places where they have done these, these changes, they've actually found that the, that the predicted um, harms actually have not manifested in nearly the ways that people thought that they would. Um, and that really has to, has to do with um, just the fact that I think we're, we're so uh, rooted in the way that things are now that it can make it hard to imagine an, an alternative future for ourselves. I'm just saying like, Barbara, your mic's off. Okay. I'm just saying, from my culture, don't throw out the trade until you have the kosher, which means you can't, you can't, you know, make it so difficult for people who are used to using their cars and drive the economics of the city for coming in from other places. I have a parking space. I'm okay. It's not for me. I'm afraid that they're going to kill the downtown. That's that's my word. Thank you so much. I really appreciate yeah. you sharing Other questions, Perry, did you want to say something about this? Well, I hear, I just want to say I do hear your concerns about coupling it with a better, you know, alternative tra you know, public transit. And, and I work with a lot of people who commute from, like you're saying, and, you know, out of town, Chester, Essex, Wilson, and um, I do think we need to have stronger options um, for people to be able to get to their work. and. Um, it's like I'm still going to move around to the community. I think that part of the reason why the alternative transit system, and I'm glad that there's not just the, um, I'm glad that the TDI, the Transportation Demand Management System, is coming into play because I would push really strongly for it and I was really concerned that it would be a handout to developers to just say you don't have to pay into um, a parking system, but we need um, them to pay into our transportation system in some way. So I, I feel really, I felt really strongly about that. I do, you know, in terms of, you know, I work with people who have mobility issues. I think, um, you know, I, it's frustrating. Sometimes I, I, I mean, I think the alternative transit gets people who don't, who don't have mobility issues, out of their car to make space, um, or just make space on the road or in our um, public right for people who do have mobility issues. And so, um, I. I I think all those things are important. I think centering people who, who have mobility issues and accessibility issues is, is super important. And also people who are just, who are priced out of living downtown and can't live where they work or live where they shop or whatever. And um, it's, yeah, they should be able to get around to where they need. It's, so I think that I'm glad you raised those points. Thank you, Brian. I was just gonna add that the, um, the requirement will go away under this scenario, under this design. But what will happen is if a developer is um, getting trying to get financing to build something, most financing sources want to see that you actually have a completely viable plan, not just that you can build something, but you have to provide some level of parking. So it'll be more market driven, if you will. So I don't think it will be as many spaces are currently required. I think you're right about that. But there won't be like they'll build buildings with zero parking. I don't think there'll be much of those. I really don't think that's going to be the case because. Banks don't really want to lend in buildings where there's zero parking because those are considered to be 
right now anyway, until we get there, those are not considered to be sort of standard kind of conventional what people are looking for in the market. Thank you. Just as it's good to have our school board members here, it's good to have our city councilors here. So thanks. Just like this. Thank you. I guess I'll just, um, I'm really hearing your concern that I don't have a car um, and find myself running around trying to catch a bus, trying to bike from place to place. It's, it's really not that easy to get around right now and, and still I feel really strongly about not having a car and that's great for me but I wonder if I have kids or if I have a mobility issue or whatever. And I, I wonder about reserve, like this is just an idea that I'm having off the top of my head, but reserving parking spots for people that have children, are over a certain age, have mobility issues, and like making it a pretty easy process to apply for those, but like reserving a significant number of parking spots so that people who are able-bodied and don't have kids or whatever, like don't, like they're, dis they're extra disincentivized to take like cars and to use public transit, they're more incentivized to use public transit, to have bikes, and without penalizing people who have those other considerations, because I really hear you. It's like, with the system as it stands, not that easy to get around. I'm happy to do it because I see the climate crisis as a greater um, barrier, but I'm also young and able to don't have kids, and so I, I really hear that concern a lot, and I wonder if something like that um, it has come up. I, I thought, Jules, thank you. I, I feel like I've had some like proto version of this, like I, but basically when there were conversations coming up with them um, at the uh, CCRPC meeting around when was, and I was like, of course we should be centering, you know, single parents or people with mobility issues or whatever. Like, wouldn't it be so great if we could just prioritize all the parking for all those people? And I, I and people from the suburbs too. Oh, sure, and people who are commuting and um, are living in the suburbs. So. Um, or just various people, and I, yeah, I'm glad that you're bringing that up. I don't, I haven't done any research on it or anything, but um, yeah, thank you for so um, articulating that idea. That's awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, everyone. Hey, last but very much not least, our state representative Brian Jean is here. Oh yes. And is Jean is Jean here? No. Okay. So you have it all to yourself. It's what I've always dreamed of. You're all mine. <laughs> so, um, what do you want to talk about? I mean, I, I, you know, I could, I could preach to you about all the things I'm working on, but I'm kind of curious. What people, maybe we could just hear some questions, you know. And, here are some concerns. Um, one thing I will start out with, I see, I love that the hands are immediately shooting up. One thing I will say is I was in the Ward 1-8 MPA last night, and somebody expressed, that they said, do we ever put like in public what we're working on? And I thought about it, and I'm like, well, like, where? I'm like, no, I don't. And every time I try to talk somewhere, like everyone else wants to out-talk me or cut me off or whatever. So there really isn't that option, and I feel bad doing it on Front Porch Forum, but then this person said to me, what do you think it's for? And like, they were like, can you please post your, what you're working on before you go back? So I'm going to do that. So for what it's worth, I'm gonna post on Front Porch Forum and then you can email it and troll me, whatever, you know, on Twitter, whatever, like, but I'll, po I'll post it. But before I do that, I, you know, I'm curious to hear, answer questions or hear what people are concerned about. Liz, no. Can um, I sit on this stool, like, like a TED talk? Yeah. 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 Chris Hayes. Um, so that so we just left a conversation about the climate crisis and transit, and so I want to pick up there because the two are so connected, municipal and state. Um, AOT has a ton of money, and a lot of that money comes from the feds, and a lot of it's codified in plans that tells that de determines where the money's going to go. And so I'm I'm a big advocate of public transit because. People, I think biking is unrealistic for anybody who's not willing to withstand biking in the winter. However capable I am, I'm not going to do that. But I would jump on the bus, and free transit doesn't actually get people to ride the bus more, because you already spend money in your car. It just saves you a lot of money. But people are, mass transit 
goes free because Mass Transit has the service, the amount of service you need to get people to ride the bus is a lot more service than you have. You need like 10 minute headways. And so um, I think if we could increase operational funding for our transit system, we could provide more service and we have a regional system. And so the only way that I can think of it is that municipalities can raise money for operational service, because impact fees pay for capital needs, not operations, is to generate like um, permit fees. Like we all have to have a local, per, um, local car registration. If we all had to register our cars locally as well as at the state, it would be a disincentive to have a car because it would make it more expensive. There was also an SUV tax that Rich Westman introduced like 15 years ago that got shot down. So having like a tax on miles per gallon or those sorts of things. So I would just ask you if you've um, discussed issues like this, I'm also really disappointed in the climate caucus, crocus. Um, and if you looked at transit, public transit, if you could please elevate that in this legislative session as more public transit service everywhere of all kinds, and we need operational money at the local level. The authority, we need the municipal authority and the tool to raise money locally. Thank you. Like the sales tax. Thank you. So I heard a statement, and then I heard some question, like a, a question, and they're sort of like, am I aware? I'm aware. And I can say that there are some of us advocating that we look at the transportation budget and be strategic about how to shift the investments of the transportation budget, and we have been doing that, more towards um, transportation that takes into account its climate impact. Um, and this, and one of the, one of the, the um, pieces of the climate caucus agenda, which I support, even though I don't think it's enough, and I'm happy to talk about what else I think we should do. Um, and I probably should at least say a little bit about that, but but I want to leave time for questions too, so I'll try to make it brief. That one of the pieces is, is working with the Transportation Climate Initiative, which will give us money to invest in, the, in those kind of projects. One of my concerns about that is, is that when we do cap and trade, we say that pollution is a commodity that, that's bought and sold. And I kind of have a philosophical problem with, with commodifying pollution. Like in our society, we, it's an extractive economy and we just continue to commodify everything. We, healthcare is a product, now pollution is going to be a product. So I, I believe it's a tool to get us moving in the right direction, so I do support it. But I think in the long term, we need to have a greater vision. And, and, I, and, and if I, I'll just take a minute to say something about that. So in terms of my own personal agenda, I support the four pieces of the Climate Caucus. I believe those are achievable, small steps that will get things moving in the right direction. Um, but I think we need more, and so I think we need a constitutional amendment protecting the rights of nature, like they have in Ecuador. In Ecuador, they call it Pachamama, Mother Earth. I don't know how we would use the language. I know Chris Pearson's working on this right now, so you will probably see an effort for a constitutional amendment because we're still in the window where we can get one out there to be considered. And, th and then that would change the foundation of our law. It would give us a chance to make arguments for generations to come about how our decisions are taking away the rights of nature. Um, I, I think that we need um, to look at revenue, and there are some people, specifically the Progressive Caucus and the House and Senate, is looking at um, the revenue sources and trying to buy, find a way to call out um, all the wealth that's being accumulated by people who are benefiting from the Bush tax cuts. And I'm not talking about like small business people who might be making saving a couple of hundred dollars a year. We're talking about millionaires and billionaires. Now, now I sound like someone else um, who are you know who are making lots of money. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and so we're just being creative about how are we taxing wealth and redistributing some of that money back towards the investments we need to make to build the public good, and like the commons. Um, and it's one, a specific idea, proposal that, that I'm working on right now, and I'm, I'm vetting by various activist groups, and I'm talking with the solid waste districts and the regional planning commissions and others, is this idea of, the, it's called an act relating, related to the just transition to a regenerative economy. And what it does is it's kind of like, it, it proposes a process to build a vision um, that's democratic. So what it would do is, is um, it has a, a section of intent where it, it makes the declaration that we're in an ecological emergency, that we're in an era of mass extinction, and that we need to drastically change the economic system from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. And that this is more than just money, it's also about power and how we distribute um, all kinds of 
natural and human resources. And then what it does is it, it calls for the formation of people's assemblies in every region of the state. And people's assemblies would work with local partners like the regional planning commissions and solid waste districts and regional development corporations. And each region would have a proposed regenerative economy plan. Those would all go to a regenerative economy council, which would be 30 something, or I'm not attached to the number, but a big council, huge council, the hugest. And it would, and it would have people from all sectors of society with different expertise who would then, they would be monitoring and watching their own regional, because there'd be people there from every region. It, they'd be participating in the people's assemblies and part of the local plan creation. And then they would come together and they would kind of lay them all out and they would say, how do we make this into a regenerative economy roadmap? And then there's a, a list of like 30 criteria that, that I've identified and I'm getting more feedback from people. And if anyone else, if anyone wants to see this, I'll send it to you and you can tell me what you think. Um, it's, I'm trying to be really transparent with this process and open. But the idea is there's, there'd be these criteria that are, that are at every level of that process. And at the end of it, we would have a 20 year vision, but it would start the process from now to 2023 would be building that roadmap. It would go from 2023 to 2043, and people are like, why, why that weird number? And it's because I don't think 2050s, I think that's too long. Like, we have to step it up. So 20 years, and for those 20 years, the People's Assemblies would meet every year to review the progress. They would report to the council. The council would report to the legislature if there is accountability measures in there. So that's a level of accountability. But then people can sue the state. They can sue local entities for not following through. I will stop there. There's a few other details I left out, but I don't, is this realistic? No. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's going to be all kinds of criticism about how, why we can't do it. But the point is that without a plan, what are we doing? We can keep throwing money at problems, but we're not going to solve the problem if we don't have a plan. And, uh, and the plan needs to be done, in my opinion, de in a democratic fashion that, that transforms the dynamics in our society about how decisions are made. And it includes the just transition principles of the Climate Justice Alliance. Um, in there, and so I'll, if anyone wants to cop, wants to see it, I'll stick around, and you can come, give me your name, and I'll email it you like tomorrow or tonight. Thank you. Sorry, um, Francesca, do you have a? You pretty much answered my question. I just wanted to re-echo a sentiment I've heard from a lot of people of feeling incredibly disappointed and frustrated by the Climate Caucus, and also the response from the officials at the Climate Caucus. Um, and I was just curious, I really like your idea, and I was wondering if you could answer honestly about if you think the things they've proposed are actually all that can be done in the time frame that they've been given, or if you think more can actually be done. I, I, honestly, I, if, I put, if I put my like visionary part of myself and I like numb it <laughs> and put it aside, which a lot of people do just to survive these days, I think that what the, what the Climate Caucus is proposing, that has been, so the process of the Climate Caucus was that we had these subcommittees and I was the chair of the Green Economy Subcommittee and we had more ideas. And then we just kind of gave our ideas to the leadership and in a not transparent process, they decided what our agenda was. And so I'm trying to do something different with the regenerative, because I learned from this, I'm like, I don't think that's the way to build a movement, and that's what we need. We need a mass movement. It's just not, it's not just gonna be convincing politicians. There needs to be pressure, because if there's enough pressure from the people, we will, people who say it's impossible will suddenly make it possible because they want to get reelected. So I think, honestly, it's, it's not, it is the realistic things we can do, functioning in the same way of thinking without a mass movement. But I do think, I, but, but that's not acceptable. To me, you know, I think we need to continue building the mass movement. We need to give people hope with realistic ideas. Not the worst thing I see is when like young people express how they feel and like uh, like a, you know, not to play into the generation wars that are going on. You know, now you know it was, it was the boomers versus millennials and now Generation X and the Generation Z are starting to fight and like that's that's the capitalist like regime like you know dividing us up with their labels. Um, but the point is that a lot of young people are expressing their concerns and they're told. You don't. You just don't know. You don't know. You you're learn, you, you need to learn. You know this is how it works. And what I'm hearing is, it it, it doesn't actually really work for everyone. Um, so I think within the current system, that those four things are actual things that we can hand to the governor, which he'll probably veto. Um, I'd like to hand him bigger things to veto, honestly. And I think we may be able to pass some of these bigger things. 
Um, and then we can vote him out. The reality is it takes years to make things happen. Indigenous Peoples Day was first proposed in Vermont 10 years ago, and it just passed this year. So it just takes time to, to some, and so that being said, we don't have time. I could go off, I'll stop, I'm sorry. I would like the meeting to end by 8.15, so Perry, do you have something to say? I'll be shorter with my English. Okay. Okay. Sorry, um, my question actually isn't about the environment, sorry. It's okay, we've given it a lot of attention, and, maybe, and there's lots of other stuff. So. Shocking, yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, I know, shocking. But um, this is coming from me, and this is just something that I've been thinking a lot about at the state level, so I just kind of wanted to hit you with it. Um, this is coming from me both as Jules' future teacher and Jules' current program assistant for Children's Integrated Services in Chicken County. And I'm just really concerned about the future of the state of Vermont when we're not adequately funding special education for children zero to age three. Um, children's Integrated Services in Vermont has been level funded for 10 years, which is essentially a cut to its funding every year because of inflation. And in addition to that, like there's now new administrative costs, so it's, it's doubly cut. Um, and we know there's so much evidence that the most critical years for children's development is around like, age two. And so, and especially in Chilton County, this has been a problem. I can't speak as much to other counties because I'm not as intimately familiar with them, but I know that like we used to have in Chilton County up until fairly recently, an intensive autism program, which we no longer have. And I know that the Mont Family Network, which provides early intervention services, which is, by the way, a federally mandated program, um, is like kind of like really having a hard time meeting the federal requirements and was actually like, audited by the federal government and like this is our requirement um, for receiving idea act funding and i'm just concerned especially when it's already like kind of a challenging place for young people to live in vermont and we have young people leaving vermont um to in, in addition to not have it feel like secure that your children are going to get their federally mandated special education services at the most critical years for their development i i just think i feel like i want this to be like on people's mind on the agenda because I know that every year there's kind of like a advocacy push for it, but I feel like it, it's not like as taken as seriously as it is in addition to wanting an environment for my future children, which is like a huge driver for me as an environmentalist. I also want the security to know that if they need special education services that they will be able to receive them. Thank you for expressing that. I, don't, I didn't hear a question, but I heard. I, 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 I hear a passionate plea for a great for. Yeah. Well, I think about it. I, I am a clinical social worker, and and I, my specialty is working with children and families. So I think about child development a lot. And in the legislature, um, one of the things we've been working on is improving the child care system. I, Personally, I would like to see a child care system that seamlessly integrates into the education system. And like, as soon as children are born, we should be providing ed educational opportunities and resources for, for families. Because then, in terms of working families, it takes a big burden off people about whether they work or they take care of their child. And that improves the stress in a child's life. And then the children are getting optimal, you know, optimal stimulation at every stage of development that, that's going to enhance their development. Um, unfortunately, what we hear when we advocate for things like this is that there's no money, there's not enough resources, and once again, it brings us back to that fundamental issue about revenue. Why is it that we live in one of the richest societies in human history, and it's like sucked all the life and all the wealth out of like 99% of the people? You and know, prevention is cheaper. It's it is cheaper. Is cheaper. Yeah, it is cheaper, and and we and there mm -hmm. for what it's worth, there's some of us who make that argument all the time. Yeah. Um, and so we can talk about this more, but it is it is in my awareness, and I'm happy to talk more about specific ideas that you have, like like later, like if you, if you can think of some specific examples in the next year where you, I'm happy to advocate. I will say that uh, I've been advocating for um, the designated agencies and the specialized service agencies, and and we were able to get a raise and a um, sort of greater investment in the designated agencies because we have this mandate of services they have to provide. But then we don't fund them, so we got we, we were able to address that, and now some of us are talking about specialized service agencies like Pathways to Housing and NFI Vermont, who are having trouble because they're not being equally funded. And so you point out another example, another another section of the population where we have a massive mandate, but we're not adequately funding people to do the work. Brian, I have a question. If it's hard to be a young person in the state, it's really hard to be an old person in the state. It turns out. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the expose that Vermont Digger, Digger and uh, VPR have done on 
the status of nursing homes and assisted living facilities in the state, that there are, in fact, re regulations that aren't enforced, and it's really having a terrible effect. And I'm hoping that this maybe wasn't on the radar of legislators before, but I hope it will be now. Well, it is now. Um, I, I, look, I, I have to look more at the actual reports because I, I saw the story. I, I expect that as a legislator, we're going to be given reports. I'm not on the Human Services Committee, I'm on the Health Care Committee, but there is an overlap, and so it is an area where, where I will be giving some attention. Um, so, you know, we need to find out more about what happened there. The, the reality is there's protections in place that were not being followed, and that's unacceptable. And it's not the only area in the last week where we heard this. I mean, look at what we well, look what has come out about what's happening in, our, in the women's prisons. Um, it, it's, com it's, it's completely unacceptable. Thanks. Um, any other? After Liz, if there's one more, I'll take that, and then we'll go right to the door. So I, I have another suggestion. She has a revenue suggestion, but the okay. money isn't working for her. Got it. Um, so, do we still have a rainy day fund, and how much is it? I can't tell you how much it is off the top of my head. Is Sorry. It's like seventy thousand million dollars. There is a reserve. The state has a fifty million reserve. dollars. Okay. Yeah. And so, every year, every year, um, we've been at since I've been in, we've been building that back up because the amount we right. have is not. So here's my suggestion. Okay. We have this really conservative state treasurer who won't who guards the money like at a ridiculous level, and we have this fifty million dollar reserve, and you could take that fifty million dollar reserve and repet and weatherize every state building and make it net zero, not by spending that 50 million, but by leveraging that 50 million for a capital source from the treasury. So she'd be happy because there's a guarantee. But all the savings from the state buildings would double repay. I mean, that would, it would be huge. And it's just sitting there doing nothing. So if nothing else, like, you know, maybe including a put that money to work in the climate conversation. I, I agree with you, and I think what the point you make is that we can be leveraging our public money in better ways. And, and if we had a state bank or a public banking system, uh, well, never say never, but, but the point is that we could be doing the same. We could be doing it in state buildings. We could be doing the same thing to invest in local economies and in, 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 in grants and in initiatives for people to start making the Green New Deal happen in other ways. Too. But I, I hear you. I, I appreciate it. I'm just saying I think we could do a lot more with that money, too. So. Okay. Is there one last um, question or comment? Is there any chance of state IRB? State IRB. There is a bill for the state IRB. Um, and there was some talk about it. People are looking at Burlington right now. They really are. They are looking at Burlington. And when some of the what I heard was, there were some people were concerned that what we did in Burlington was going to sabotage the statewide effort because if it doesn't happen here, then it's used by people. And so what happened here, which my understanding was a, like a procedural maneuver to like delay it is being used by people to say there's not the political will. So I think we need to once again build a movement around the state to say the people want a better system. If there is a chance it can happen on a statewide level if we do that. One more comment over here. Hi, Brian. Um, I just would like to know what your main priorities are coming into the new session. It's a long list and, I, and we have to end in a few minutes. Can I just say a few topic areas? Fast, fast, fast. Fast, fast. fast. All right. So um, one area that I talked about was environmental justice. Another is um, economic justice, like um, the raising the wage paid family leave and a car check bill for, for the labor movement. Um, in terms of racial justice, uh, there's a set of anti-racism bills that look at criminal justice reform and addressing raci uh, systemic racism. And one other thing I'll throw out there, because there are a lot, two more things and then I'll stop. One is making sure that we follow through on the recommendations of the Artificial Intelligence Task Force. People aren't giving it enough attention, but it poses as great of an existential threat as climate change, and it's happening kind of under the radar. Um, and then the last thing I will say is uh, around criminal justice reform, that I've been advocating for us to change our model towards something similar to the Norway model. And what's unfortunate is the Commissioner of Corrections was looking into that and taking significant steps in the right direction. 
And so I'm hoping that this does not derail that. That if the person is not in charge anymore, of, of that, that that vision can still happen because we could be doing things better in the criminal justice system in so many ways. I'll stop there. Those are a few of the priorities. Thank you very much. Thanks. I have to say that all the times that I've been coming by, it is the most consistent state that to here, and I really appreciate that. It's probably mostly the food that you make. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I, I really love our MPA, so I've been coming since before I was elected to anything. I love the MPA. Is there anybody, People's Assemblies! Yeah. Is there anybody out there that doesn't have one in here who would like to be the person who draws this? Um, it's a $20 gift certificate at Barrio. Before. Before. Trav. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for staying. Have wonderful holidays. Have a great New Year.